Section 18 of A Budget of Christmas Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Jane Conlon. The Christmas Princess by Mrs. Molesworth. In the olden times, there lived a king who was worthy of the name. He loved his people, and his people loved him in return. His kingdom must have been large. At least it appears to be beyond doubt that it extended a good way in different directions, for it was called the kingdom of the four orts, which, of course, as everybody knows, means that he had possessions north, south, east, and west. It was not so large, however, but that he was able to manage it well for himself, that is to say, with certain help, which I will tell you of. A year never passed without his visiting every part of his dominions and inquiring for himself into the affairs of his subjects. Perhaps, who can say, the world was not so big in those days. Doubtless, however that may have been, there were not so many folk living on it. Many things were different in those times, Many things existed which nowadays would be thought strange and incredible. Human beings knew much more than they do now about the other dwellers on the earth. For instance, it was no uncommon case to find learned men who were able to converse with animals quite as well as with each other. Fairies, of course, were often visible to mortal eyes, and it was considered quite natural that they should interfere for good sometimes perhaps for evil, as to that I cannot say, in human affairs. And good King Braveheart was especially favored in this way. For the help which, as I said, was his in governing his people, was that of four very wise counselors indeed, the four fairies of the north and the south, the east and the west. These sisters were very beautiful, as well as very wise. Though older than the world itself, they always looked young. They were very much attached to each other, though they seldom met. And it must be confessed that sometimes, on such occasions, there were stormy scenes, though they made it up afterward. And the advice they gave was always to be relied upon. Now King Braveheart was married. His wife was young and charming and devotedly fond of him, but she was of a rather jealous and exacting disposition, and she had been much spoilt in her youth at her own home. She was sweet and loving, however, which makes up for a good deal, and always ready to take part in any scheme for the good of their people, provided it did not separate her from her husband. They had no children, though they had been married for some years. But at last there came the hope of an heir, and the queen's delight was unbounded, nor was the king's joy less than hers. It was late autumn, or almost winter, when a great trouble befell the pretty queen. The weather had grown suddenly cold, and a few snowflakes even had fallen before their time. But Queen Claribel only clapped her hands at the sight, for with the winter she hoped the baby would come and she welcomed the signs of its approach on this account. The king, however, looked grave, and when the next morning the ground was all white, the trees and the bushes covered with silvery foliage, he looked graver still. Something is amiss, he said. The fairy of the north must be on her way, and it is not yet time for her visit. And that very afternoon the snow fell again, more heavily than before, and the frost wind whistled down the chimneys and burst open the doors and windows, and all the palace servants went hurrying and scurrying about to make great fires and hang up thick curtains and get everything in order for the cold season, which they had not expected so soon. It will not last, said the king quietly. In a few days there will be milder weather again. But nevertheless, he still looked grave. And early the next morning, as he was sitting with the queen, 
who was beginning to feel a little frightened at the continuance of the storm, the double doors of her boudoir suddenly flew open, an icy blast filled the room, and a tall, white-shrouded figure stood before them. "'I have come to fetch you, brave heart," she said abruptly. "'You are wanted, sorely wanted, in my part of the world. The people are starving. The season has been a poor one, and there has been bad faith. Some few powerful men have bought up the grain, which was already scarce, and refused to let the poor folk have it. Nothing will save their lives or prevent sad suffering but your own immediate presence. Are you ready? You must have seen I was coming. She threw off her mantle as she spoke and sank onto a couch. Strong as she was, she seemed tired with the rate at which she had traveled, and the warm air of the room was oppressive to her. Her clear, beautiful features looked harassed, her gray eyes full of anxiety. For the moment, she took no notice of the queen. Are you ready? she repeated. Yes, I am ready, said Braveheart, as he rose to his feet. But the queen threw herself upon him with bitter crying and reproaches. Would he leave her, and at such a time, a prey to all kinds of terrible anxiety? Then she turned to the fairy and upbraided her in unmeasured language. But the spirit of the north glanced at her with calm pity. Poor child, she said, I had almost forgotten you. The sights I have seen of late have been so terrible that they absorb me. Take courage, Clarabelle. Show yourself a queen. Think of the suffering mothers and their little ones whom your husband hastens to aid. All will be well with you, believe me. But you too must be brave and unselfish. It was no use. All she said but made the queen more indignant. She would scarcely bid her husband farewell. She turned her back to the fairy with undignified petulance. Foolish child, said the northern spirit. She will learn better some day. Then she gave all her attention to the matter she had come about, explaining to the king as they journeyed exactly the measures he must take and the difficulties to be overcome. But though the king had the greatest faith in her advice, and never doubted that it was his duty to obey, his heart was sore, as you can understand. Things turned out as he had said. The severe weather disappeared again as if by magic, and some weeks of unusually mild days followed. And when the winter did set in for good at last, it was with no great rigor. From time to time, News reached the palace of the king's welfare. The tidings were cheering. His presence was affecting all that the fairy had hoped. So Queen Clarabel ought to have been happy, but she was determined not to be. She did nothing but cry and abuse the fairy, declaring that she would never see her dear brave heart again, and that if ever her baby came, she was sure it would not live, or that there would be something dreadful the matter with it. It is not fair, she kept saying. It is a shame that I should suffer so. And even when, on Christmas Eve, a beautiful little girl was born, as pretty and lively and healthy as could be wished, and even though the next day brought the announcement of the king's immediate return, Clarabelle still nursed her resentment, though in the end it came to be directed entirely against the fairy. For when she saw Braveheart again, his tender affection and his delight in his little daughter made it impossible for her not to forgive him, as she expressed it, though she could not take any interest in his accounts of his visit to the North and all he had been able to do there. A great feast was arranged in honor of the christening of the little princess. All the grand people of the neighborhood were bidden to it, nor, you may be sure, did the good king forget the poorer folk. The four fairies were invited, for it was a matter of course that they should be the baby's godmothers. And though the queen would gladly have excluded the northern fairy, she dared not even hint at such a thing. 
but she resolved in her own mind to do all in her power to show that she was not the welcome fairy. On such occasions, when human beings were honored by the presence of fairy visitors, these distinguished guests were naturally given precedence of all others. Otherwise, very certainly they would never have come again. Even among fairies themselves, there are ranks and formalities, and the queen well knew that the first place was due to the northern spirit. But she gave instructions that this rule should be departed from, and the snow fairy, as she was sometimes called, found herself placed at the king's left hand, separated from him by her sister of the west, instead of next to him on the right, which seat, on the contrary, was occupied by the fairy of the south. She glanced round her calmly, but took no notice, and the king, imagining that by her own choice, perhaps, she had chosen the unusual position, made no remark, and the feast progressed with the accustomed splendor and rejoicing. But at the end, when the moment arrived at which the four godmothers were expected to state their gifts to the baby, the queen's spite could be no longer concealed. I request, she exclaimed, that for reasons well known to herself, to the king, and to myself, the northern fairy's gift may be the last in order instead of the first. The king started and grew pale. The beautiful soft-voiced fairy of the south, in her glowing golden draperies, would fain have held back, for her affection for her sterner sister was largely mingled with awe but the snow fairy signed to her imperiously to speak. "'I bestow upon Princess Sweetheart,' she said, half-tremblingly, "'the gift of great beauty.' "'And I,' said the spirit of the East, who came next, her red robes falling majestically around her, her dark hair lying smoothly in its thick masses on her broad, low forehead, "'I give her great powers of intellect and intelligence.' And I, said the western fairy, with a bright, breezy flutter of her sea-green garments, health, perfect health and strength of body, as my gift to the pretty child. And you, said the queen bitterly, you cold-hearted fairy, who have done your best to kill me with misery, who came between my husband and me, making him neglect me as he never would have done but for your influence, what will you give my child? Will you do something to make amends for the suffering you caused? I would rather my pretty baby were dead than that she lived to endure what I have of late endured. Life and death are not mine to bestow or withhold, said the northern spirit calmly, as she drew her white garments more closely round her with a majestic air. So your rash words, foolish woman, fortunately for you all, cannot touch the child. But something, much, I can do, and I will. She shall not know the suffering you dread for her with so cowardly a fear. She shall be what you choose to fancy I am. And instead of the name you have given her, she shall be known for what she is. Princess Iceheart. She turned to go, but the king on one hand, her three sisters on the other, started forward to detain her. "'Have pity!' exclaimed the former. "'Sister, bethink you!' said the latter. The western fairy added beseechingly, the tears springing in her blue eyes, which so quickly changed from bright to sad. "'Say something to soften this hard fate!' Undo it you cannot, I know, or at least allow me to mitigate it if I can. The snow fairy stopped. In truth, she was far from hard-hearted or remorseless, and already she was beginning to feel half sorry for what she had done. What do you propose? she said coldly. The fairy of the West threw back her auburn hair with a gesture of impatience. I would I knew, she said. "'Tis a hard knot you have tied, my sister. "'For that which would mend the evil wrought "'seems to me impossible while the evil exists. 
the cure and the cessation of the disease are one. How could the heart of ice be melted till tender feelings warm it? And how can tender feelings find entrance into a feelingless heart? Alas, alas, I can but predict what sounds like a mockery of your trouble, she went on, turning to the king, though indeed by this time she might have included the queen in her sympathy. For Clarabel stood, horrified at the result of her mad resentment, as pale as Braveheart himself. Hearken! And her expressive face, over which sunshine and showers were wont to chase each other as on an April day, for such, as all know, is the nature of the changeful, lovable spirit of the West, for once grew still and statue-like, while her blue eyes pierced far into the distance. The day on which the princess of the icy heart shall shed a tear, that heart shall melt, but then only. The northern fairy murmured something under her breath, but what the words were no one heard, for it was not many that dared stand near to her, so terribly cold was her presence. The graceful spirit of the south fluttered her golden locks, and with a little sigh, drew her radiant mantle round her, and kissed her hand in farewell, while the thoughtful-eyed, mysterious eastern fairy linked her arm in that of her western sister, and whispered that the solution of the problem should have her most earnest study. And the green-robed spirit tried to smile through her tears in farewell, as she suffered herself to be led away. So the four strange guests departed but their absence was not followed by the usual outburst of unconstrained festivity. On the contrary, a sense of sorrow and dread hung over all who remained, and before long, everyone not immediately connected with the palace respectfully but silently withdrew, leaving the king and queen to their mysterious sorrow. Clarabel flew to the baby's cradle. The little princess was sleeping soundly, she looked rosy and content, a picture of health. Her mother called eagerly to the king. She seems just as usual, she exclaimed. Perhaps, oh, perhaps, after all, I have done no harm. For, strange to say, her resentment against the northern fairy had died away. She now felt nothing but shame and regret for her own wild temper. Perhaps, she went on, it was but to try me, to teach me a lesson that the snow fairy uttered those terrible words. Braveheart pitied his wife deeply, but he shook his head. I dare not comfort you with any such hopes, he said, my poor Clarabel. The fairy is true, true as steel. If you could but have trusted her, had you seen her as I have done, full of tenderest pity for suffering, you could never have so maligned her. Clarabel did not answer, but her tears dropped on the baby's face. The little princess seemed annoyed by them. She put up her tiny hand and, with a fretful expression, brushed them off. And that very evening, the certainty came. The head nurse sent for the queen while she was undressing the child, and the mother hastened to the nursery. The attendants were standing round in the greatest anxiety, for, though the baby looked quite well otherwise, there was the strangest coldness over her left side in the region of the heart. The skin looked perfectly colorless, and the soft cambric and still softer flannel of the finest which had covered the spot were stiff as if they had been exposed to a winter night's frost. Alas! exclaimed Clarabel. But that was all. It was no use sending for doctors, no use doing anything. Her own delicate hand, when she laid it on the baby's heart, was, as it were, blistered with cold. The next morning she found it covered with chillblains. But the baby did not mind. She flourished amazingly, heart or no heart. She was perfectly healthy, ate well, slept well, and soon gave signs of unusual intelligence. 
she was seldom put out, but when angry, she expressed her feelings by loud roars and screams, though with never a tear. At first, this did not seem strange, as no infant sheds tears during the earliest weeks of its life. But when she grew to six months old, then to a year, then to two and three, and was near her fourth birthday without ever crying, it became plain that the prediction was indeed to be fulfilled. And the name Iceheart clung to her. In spite of all her royal parents' commands to the contrary, Princess Iceheart she was called far and near. It seemed as if people could not help it. Sweetheart, we cannot name her, for sweet she is not, was murmured by all who came in contact with her. And it was true. Sweet she certainly was not. She was beautiful and healthy and intelligent, but she had no feeling. In some ways, she gave little trouble. Her temper, though occasionally violent, was, as a rule, placid. She seemed contented in almost all circumstances. When her good old nurse died, she remarked coolly that she hoped her new attendant would dress her hair more becomingly. When King Braveheart started on some of his distant journeys, she bade him goodbye with a smile, observing that if he never came home again, it would be rather amusing, as she would then reign instead of him. And when she saw her mother break into sobs at her unnatural speech, she stared at her in blank astonishment. And so things went on until Iceheart reached her seventeenth year. By this time she was, as regarded her outward appearance, as beautiful as the fondest of parents could desire. She was also exceedingly strong and healthy, and the powers of her mind were unusual. Her education had been carefully directed, and she had learnt with ease and interest. She could speak in several languages. Her paintings were worthy of admiration, as they were skillful and well executed. She could play with brilliancy on various instruments. She had also been taught to sing, but her voice was metallic and unpleasing. But she could discuss scientific and philosophical subjects with the sages of her father's kingdom like one of themselves. And besides all this care bestowed upon her training, no stone had been left unturned in hopes of awakening in the unfortunate girl some affection or emotion. Every day the most soul-stirring poetry was read aloud to her by the greatest elocutionists. The most exciting and moving dramas were enacted before her. She was taken to visit the poor of the city in their pitiable homes. She was encouraged to see sad sights, from which most soft-hearted maidens would instinctively flee. But all was in vain. She would express interest and ask intelligent questions with calm, unmoved features and dry eyes. Even music, from which much had been hoped, was powerless to move her to aught but admiration of the performer's skill or curiosity as to the construction of their instruments. There was but one peculiarity about her, which sometimes, though they could not have explained why, seemed to Iceheart's unhappy parents to hint at some shadowy hope. The sight of tears was evidently disagreeable to her. More certainly than anything else did the signs of weeping arouse one of her rare fits of anger, so much so that now and then for days together the poor queen dared not come near her child, and tears were to her a frequent relief from her lifelong regrets. So beautiful and wealthy and accomplished a maiden was naturally not without suitors. And from this direction, too, at first, Queen Clarabel trusted fondly the cure might come. If she could but fall in love, she said, the first time the idea struck her. My poor dear, replied the king, to see you must have eyes, to love you must have a heart. But a heart she has, persisted the mother. It is only, as it were, asleep, frozen, 
like the winter stream which bursts forth again into ever fresh life and movement with the awakening spring. So lovers were invited, and lovers came, and were made welcome by the dozen. Lovers of every description, rich and poor, old and young, handsome and ugly. So long as they were of passable birth and fair character, King Braveheart was not too particular, in the forlorn hope that among them one fortunate wight might rouse some sentiment in the lovely statue he desired to win. But all in vain. Each prince or duke or simply knight, duly instructed in the sad case, did his best. One would try poetry, another his lute, a third sighs and appeals, a fourth, imagining he had made some way, would attempt the bold stroke of telling Iceheart that unless she could respond to his adoration, he would drown himself. She only smiled and begged him to allow her to witness the performance. She had never seen anyone drown. So, one by one, the troop of aspirants, some in disgust, some in strange fear, some in annoyance, took their departure, preferring a more ordinary spouse than the bewitched, though beautiful, princess. And she saw them go with calmness, though in one or two cases she had replied to her parents that she had no objection to marry Prince so-and-so or Count such-another if they desired it. It would be rather agreeable to have a husband if he gave her plenty of presents and did all she asked. Though a sighing and moaning lover, or a man who was always twiddling a fiddle or making verses I could not stand, she would add contemptuously. So King Braveheart thought it best to try no such experiment, and in future no gentleman was allowed to present himself except with the understanding that he alone who should succeed in making Princess Iceheart shed a tear would be accepted as her betrothed. This proclamation diminished at once the number of suitors. Indeed, after one or two candidates had failed, no more appeared. So well did it come to be known that the attempt was hopeless. And for more than a year Princess Iceheart was left to herself, very much apparently to her satisfaction. But all this time the mystic sisters were not idle or forgetful, Several of the aspirants to Iceheart's hand had been chosen by them and conveyed to the neighborhood of the palace by their intermediacy from remote lands. And among these, one of the few who had found some slight favor in the maiden's eyes was a special protege of the western fairy, the young and spirited Prince Franklin. He was not one of the sighing or sentimental order of swains, he was full of life and adventure and brightness, and his heart was warm and generous. He admired the beautiful girl, but he pitied her still more, and this pity was the real motive which made him yield to the fairy's proposal that he should try again. "'You please the poor child,' she said, when she arrived one day at the prince's home to talk over her new idea." You made her smile by your liveliness and fun, for I was there when you little knew it. The girl has been overdosed with sentimentality and doleful strains. I believe we have been on a wrong track all this time. What do you propose? said Franklin gravely, for he could be serious enough when seriousness was called for. She did not actually dislike me, but that is the most that can be said and however I may feel for her, however I may admire her beauty and intelligence, nothing would induce me to wed a bride who could not return my affection. Indeed, I could scarcely feel any for such a one. Ah, oh, no, I agree with you entirely, said the fairy. But listen, my power is great in some ways. I am well versed in ordinary enchantment, and am most willing to employ my utmost skill for my unfortunate goddaughter. She then unfolded to him her scheme and obtained his consent to it. Now is your time, she said in conclusion. 
I hear on the best authority that Iceheart is feeling rather dull and bored at present. It is some time since she has had the variety of a new suitor, and she will welcome any distraction. And she proceeded to arrange all the details of her plan. So it came to pass that very shortly after the conversation I have related, there was great excitement in the capital city of the kingdom of the four orts. After an interval of more than a year, a new suitor had at length presented himself for the hand of the princess Iceheart. Only the king and queen received the news with melancholy indifference. "'He may try as the others have done,' said Braveheart to the messenger, announcing the arrival of the stranger at the gates, accompanied by a magnificent retinue. But it is useless. For the poor king was fast losing all hope of his daughter's case. He was growing aged and careworn before his time. "'Does he know the terms attached to his acceptance?' inquired the queen. Yes. The messenger from the unknown candidate for the hand of the beautiful Iceheart had been expressly charged to say that the Prince Jocko, such was the newcomer's name, was fully informed as to all particulars and prepared to comply with the conditions. The princess's parents smiled somewhat bitterly. They had no hope, but still they could not forbid the attempt. Prince Jocko, said the king, not a very prince-like name. However, it matters little. A few hours later, the royal pair and their daughter, with all their attendants, in great state and ceremony, were awaiting their guest. And soon a blast of trumpets announced his approach. His retinue was indeed magnificent. Horsemen in splendid uniforms, followed by a troop of white mules with negro riders in gorgeous attire, then musicians, succeeded by the prince's immediate attendants, defiled before the great marble steps in front of the palace, at the summit of which the king, with the queen and princess, was seated in state. Iceheart clapped her hands. "'Tis as good as a show,' she said. "'But where is the prince?' As she said the word, the cortege halted. A litter with closely drawn curtains drew up at the foot of the steps. Gracious! exclaimed the princess. I hope he is not a mollycoddle. But before there was time to say more, the curtains of the litter were drawn aside, and in another moment an attendant had lifted out its occupant, who forthwith proceeded to ascend the steps. The parents and their daughter stared at each other and gasped. Prince Jocko was neither more nor less than a monkey. But such a monkey as never before had been seen. He was more comical than words can express, and when at last he stood before them and bowed to the ground, a three-cornered hat in his hand, his sword sticking straight out behind, his tail sweeping the ground, the effect was irresistible. King Braveheart turned his head aside. Queen Clarabelle smothered her face in her handkerchief. Princess Iceheart opened her pretty mouth wide and forgot to close it again, while a curious expression stole into her beautiful eyes. Was it a trick? No. Prince Jocko proceeded to speak. He laid his little brown paw on his heart, bowed again, coughed, sneezed, and finally began an oration. If his appearance was too funny, his words and gestures were a hundred times more so. He rolled his eyes, he declaimed, he posed and pirouetted like a miniature dancing master, and his little cracked voice rose higher and higher as his own fine words and expressions increased in eloquence. And at last, a sound, which never before had been heard, save faintly, made everyone start. The princess was laughing as if she could no longer contain herself. Clear, ringing, merry laughter, which it did one's heart good to hear. And on she went, laughing ever, till 
she flung herself at her mother's feet, the tears rolling down her cheeks. Oh, mamma, she exclaimed, I never... And then she went off again. But Prince Jocko suddenly grew silent. He stepped up to Iceheart and, respectfully raising her hand to his lips, gazed earnestly, beseechingly into her face, his own keen, sharp eyes gradually growing larger and deeper in expression, till they assumed the pathetic, wistful look of appeal one often sees in those of a noble dog. Ah, princess, he murmured, and Iceheart stopped laughing. She pressed her hand to her side. Father, mother, she cried, help me, help me. Am I dying? What has happened to me? And with a strange, long-drawn sigh, she sank fainting to the ground. There was great excitement in the palace, hurrying to and fro, fetching of doctors and much alarm. But when the princess had been carried indoors and laid on a couch, she soon revived. And who can describe the feelings of the king and queen when she turned to them with a smile such as they had never seen on her face before? Dearest father, dearest mother, she said, how I love you. Those strange warm drops that filled my eyes seem to have brought new life to me. And as the queen passed her arm round the maiden, she felt no chill of cold such as used to thrill her with misery every time she embraced her child. Sweetheart, my own sweetheart, she whispered. And the princess whispered back, Yes, call me by that name always. All was rejoicing when the wonderful news of the miraculous cure spread through the palace and the city. But still, the parents' hearts were sore, for was not the king's word pledged that his daughter should marry him who had effected this happy change? And this was no other than Jocko the monkey. The prince had disappeared at the moment that Iceheart fainted, and now, with his retinue, he was encamped outside the walls. All sorts of ideas occurred to the king. "'I cannot break my word,' he said, "'but we might try to persuade the little monster to release me from it.' But the princess would not hear of this. "'No,' she said. "'I owe him too deep a debt of gratitude to think of such a thing.' and in his eyes I read more than I can put in words. No, dear father, you must summon him at once to be presented to our people as my affianced husband. So again the cortege of Prince Jocko made its way to the palace, and again the litter, with its closely drawn curtains, drew up at the marble steps. And Sweetheart stood, pale but calm and smiling, to welcome her ridiculous betrothed. But who is this that quickly mounts the stairs with firm and manly tread? Sweetheart nearly swooned again. Jocko? she murmured. Where's Jocko? Why, this is Prince Franklin. Yes, dear child, said a bright voice beside her, and turning round, Sweetheart beheld the western fairy who, with her sisters, had suddenly arrived. Yes, indeed, Franklin and no other. The universal joy may be imagined. Even the grave fairy of the north smiled with pleasure and delight, and, as she kissed her pretty goddaughter, she took the girl's hand and pressed it against her own heart. Never misjudge me, sweetheart, she whispered, cold as I seem to those who have not courage to approach me closely. My heart, under my icy mantle, is as warm as is now your own. And so it was. Where can we get a better ending than the time-honored one? Franklin and sweetheart were married and lived happily ever after. And who knows but what, in the kingdom of the four orts, they are living happily still. 
If only we knew the way thither, we might see for ourselves if it is so. End of section 18. Recording by Mary Jane Conlon. Section 19 of A Budget of Christmas Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Glennie Junkin, St. Charles, Missouri. Widow Townsend's Visitor. The fire crackled cheerfully on the broad hearth of an old-fashioned fireplace in an old-fashioned public house in an old-fashioned village down in that part of the old dominion called the eastern shore a cat and three kittens basked in the warmth and a decrepit yellow dog lying full in the reflection of the blaze wrinkled his black nose approvingly as he turned his hind feet where his forefeet had been over the chimney hung several fine hams and pieces of dried beef apples were festooned along the ceiling and other signs of plenty and good cheer were scattered profusely about there were plants too on the window ledges horseshoe geraniums and dew plants and a monthly rose just budding to say nothing of pots of violets that perfumed the whole place whenever they took it into their purple heads to bloom the floor was carefully swept the chairs had not a speck of dust upon leg or round the long settle near the fireplace shone as if it had been just varnished and the eight-day clock in the corner had had its white face newly washed and seemed determined to tick the louder for it two armchairs were drawn up at cosy distance from the hearth and each other a candle a newspaper a pair of spectacles a dish of red-cheeked apples and a pitcher of cider filled a little table between them in one of these chairs sat a comfortable-looking woman about forty-five, with cheeks as red as the apples and eyes as dark and bright as they had ever been, resting her elbow on the table and her head upon her hand and looking thoughtfully into the fire. This was Widow Townsend, relict of Mr. Levi Townsend, who had been moldering into dust in the neighboring churchyard for seven years and more. She was thinking of her dead husband, possibly because all her work being done and the servant gone to bed the sight of his empty chair at the other side of the table and the silence of the room made her a little lonely seven years so the widow's reverie ran it seems as if it were more than fifty and christmas nigh here again and yet i don't look so very old neither perhaps it's not having any children to bother my life out as other people have they may say what they like children are more plague than profit that's my opinion look at my sister jerusha with her six boys she's worn to a shadow and i'm sure they have done it though she never will own it the widow took an apple from the dish and began to peel it how fond mr townsend used to be of these apples he'll never eat any more of them poor fellow for i don't suppose they have apples where he has gone to hey ho i remember very well how i used to throw apple peel over my head when i was a girl to see who i was going to marry mrs townsend stopped short and blushed for in those days she did not know mr t and was always looking eagerly to see if the peel had formed a capital s her meditations took a new turn how handsome sam payson was and how much i used to care about him i wonder what has become of him jerusa says he went away from our village just after i did and no one has ever heard of him since what a silly thing that quarrel was if it had not been for that here came a long pause during which the widow looked very steadfastly at the empty armchair of levi townsend deceased her fingers played carelessly with the apple peel she drew it safely towards her and looked around the room upon my word it is very ridiculous and i don't know what the neighbors would say if they saw me still the plump fingers drew the red peel nearer but then they can't see me that's a comfort and the cat and old bows never will know what it means of course i don't believe anything about it the peel hung gracefully from her hand but still i should like to try it would seem like old times and 
Over her head it went, and curled up quietly on the floor at a little distance. Old Bose, who always slept with one eye open, saw it fall and marched deliberately up to smell it. Bose! Bose, don't touch! cried his mistress, and bending over it with beating heart, she turned as red as fire. There was as handsome a capital S as any one could wish to see. A great knock came suddenly at the door. Bose growled, and the widow screamed and snatched up the apple peel. It's Mr. T. It's his spirit come back again, because I tried that silly trick, she thought fearfully to herself. Another knock, louder than the first, and a man's voice exclaimed, Hello, the house. Who is it? asked the widow, somewhat relieved to find that the departed Levi was still safe in his grave on the hillside. A stranger, said the voice. What do you want? To get a lodging here for the night. The widow deliberated. Can't you go on? There's a house half a mile farther if you keep to the right side of the road and turn to the left after you get by. It's raining cats and dogs, and I'm very delicate, said the stranger, coughing. I'm wet to the skin. Don't you think you can accommodate me? I don't mind sleeping on the floor. Raining, is it? I didn't know that. And the kind-hearted little woman unbarred the door very quickly. Come in, whoever you may be. I only asked you to go on because I'm a lone woman with only one servant in the house. The stranger entered, shaking himself like a Newfoundland dog upon the step and scattering a little shower of drops over his hostess and her nicely swept floor. Ah, that looks comfortable after a man has been out for hours in a storm, he said as he caught sight of the fire and striding along toward the hearth, followed by Bose, who sniffed suspiciously at his heels, he stationed himself in the armchair, Mr. Townsend's armchair, which had been kept sacred to his memory for seven years. The widow was horrified, but her guest looked so weary and worn out that she could not ask him to move, but busied herself in stirring up the blaze that he might the sooner dry his dripping clothes. A new thought struck her. Mr. T. had worn a comfortable dressing gown during his illness, which still hung in the closet at her right. She could not let this poor man catch his death by sitting in that wet coat. If he was in Mr. Townsend's chair, why should he not be in Mr. Townsend's wrapper? She went nimbly to the closet, took it down, fished out a pair of slippers from a boot rack below, and brought them to him. I think you had better take off your coat and boots. You will have the rheumatic fever or something like it if you don't. Here are some things for you to wear while they are drying, and you must be hungry too. I will go into the pantry and get you something to eat. She bustled away on hospitable thoughts intent, and the stranger made the exchange with a quizzical smile playing around his lips. He was a tall, well-formed man, with a bold but handsome face, sunburned and heavily bearded, and looking anything but delicate, though his blue eyes glanced out from under a forehead as white as snow. He looked around the kitchen with a mischievous air and stretched out his feet decorated with the defunct Boniface's slippers. "'Upon my word, this is stepping into the old man's shoes with a vengeance. "'And what a hearty, good-humoured-looking woman she is, kind as a kitten.' "'And he leaned forward and stroked the cat in her brood, "'and then patted old Bose upon the head. "'The widow, bringing in sundry good things, "'looked pleased at his attention to her dumb friends. "'It's a wonder Bose does not growl. "'He generally does if strangers touch him. "'Dear me, how stupid!' The last remark was neither addressed to the stranger nor to the dog, but to herself. She had forgotten that the little stand was not empty and there was no room on it for the things she held. "'Oh, I'll manage it,' said her guest, gathering up paper, candle, apples, and spectacles. It was not without a little pang that she saw them in his hand, for they had been her husband's and were placed each night, like the armchair, beside her, and depositing them on the settle." "'Give me the tablecloth, ma'am. I can spread it as well as any woman. I've learned that, along with scores of other things in my wanderings. Now let me relieve you of those dishes. They are far too heavy for those hands,' the widow blushed. "'And now, please, sit down with me, or I cannot eat a morsel.' "'I had supper long ago, but really I think I can take something more,' said Mrs. Townsend, drawing her chair nearer to the table." "'Of course you can, my dear lady. "'In this cold fall weather, "'people ought to eat twice as much as they do in warm. "'Let me give you a piece of this ham. 
your own curing i dare say yes my poor husband was very fond of it he used to say that no one understood curing ham and drying beef better than i he was a most sensible man i am sure i drink your health ma'am and this cider he took a long draught and set down his glass it is like nectar the widow was feeding bows and the cat who thought they were entitled to a share of every meal eaten in the house and did not quite hear what he said fine dog ma'am and a very pretty cat they were my husband's favorites and a sigh followed the answer ah your husband must have been a very happy man the blue eyes looked at her so long that she grew flurried is there anything more i can get for you sir she asked at last nothing thank you i have finished she rose to clear the things away he assisted her and somehow their hands had a queer knack of touching as they carried the dishes to the pantry shelves coming back to the kitchen she put the apples and cider in their old places and brought out a clean pipe and a box of tobacco from an arched recess near the chimney my husband always said he could not sleep after eating supper late unless he smoked she said perhaps you would like to try it not if it is to drive you away he answered for she had her candle in her hand oh no i do not object to smoke at all she put the candle down some faint suggestion about propriety troubled her but she glanced at the old clock and felt reassured it was only half past nine the stranger pushed the stand back after the pipe was lit and drew her easy chair a little nearer the fire and his own come sit down he said pleadingly it's not late and when a man has been knocking about in california and all sorts of places for a score of years he is glad enough to get into a berth like this and to have a pretty woman to speak to once again california have you been in california she exclaimed dropping into the chair at once unconsciously she had long cherished the idea that sam payson the lover of her youth with whom she had so foolishly quarrelled had pitched his tent after many wanderings in that far-off land her heart warmed to one who with something of sam's looks and ways about him had also been sojourning in that country and who very possibly had met him perhaps had known him intimately at that thought her heart beat quick and she looked very graciously at the bearded stranger who wrapped in mr townsend's dressing gown wearing mr townsend's slippers and sitting in mr townsend's chair beside mr townsend's wife smoked mr townsend's pipe with such an air of feeling most thoroughly and comfortably at home yes ma'am i've been in california for the last six years and before that i went quite round the world in a whaling ship good gracious the stranger sent a puff of smoke curling gracefully over his head it's very strange my dear lady how often you see one thing as you go wandering about the world after that fashion and what is that men without house or home above their heads roving here and there and turning up in all sorts of odd places carrying very little for life as a general thing and making fortunes just to fling them away again and all for one reason you don't ask me what that is no doubt you know already very well i think not sir because a woman has jilted them here was a long pause and mr townsend's pipe emitted short puffs with surprising rapidity a guilty conscience needs no accuser and the widow's cheek was dyed with blushes as she thought of the absent sam i wonder how women manage when they get served in the same way said the stranger musingly you never meet them roaming up and down in that style no said mrs townsend with some spirit if a woman is in trouble she must stay at home and bear it the best way she can and there's more women bearing such things than we know of i dare say like enough we never know whose hand gets pinched in a trap unless they scream and women are too shy or too sensible which you choose for that did you ever in all your wanderings meet any one by the name of samuel payson asked the widow unconcernedly the stranger looked toward her she was rummaging the table drawer for her knitting work and did not notice him when it was found and the needles in motion he answered her payson sam payson why he was my most intimate friend do you know him 
a little that is i used to when i was a girl where did you meet him he went with me on the whaling voyage i told you of and afterward to california we had a tent together and some other fellows with us and we worked the same claim for more than six months i suppose he was quite well strong as an ox and and happy pursued the widow bending closer over her knitting hum the less said about that the better perhaps but he seemed to enjoy life after a fashion of his own and he got rich out there or rather i will say well off mrs townsend did not pay much attention to that part of the story evidently she had not finished asking questions but she was puzzled about her next one at last she brought it out beautifully was his wife with him in california the stranger looked at her with twinkling eyes his wife ma'am why bless you he's not got any wife oh i thought i mean i heard here the little widow remembered the fate of ananias and sapphira and stopped short before she told such a tremendous fib whatever you heard of his marrying was all nonsense i can assure you i knew him well and he had no thoughts of the kind about him some of the boys used to tease him about it but he soon made them stop how he just told them frankly that the only woman he ever loved had jilted him years before and married another man after that no one ever mentioned the subject to him except me mrs townsend laid her knitting aside and looked thoughtfully into the fire he was another specimen of the class of men i was speaking of i have seen him face death a score of times as quietly as i face the fire it matters very little what takes me off he used to say i've nothing to live for and there's no one that will shed a tear for me when i'm gone it's a sad thought for a man to have isn't it mrs townsend sighed as she said she thought it was but did he ever tell you the name of the woman who jilted him i know her first name what was it maria the plump little widow almost started out of her chair the name was spoken so exactly as sam would have said it did you know her too he asked looking keenly at her yes intimately yes where is she now still happy with her husband i suppose and never giving a thought to the poor fellow she drove out into the world no said mrs townsend shading her face with her hand and speaking unsteadily no her husband is dead ah but still she never thinks of sam there was a dead silence does she how can i tell are you still friends yes then you ought to know when you do tell me i'm sure i don't know why i should but if i do you must promise me on your honor never to tell him if you ever meet him again madam what you say to me never shall be repeated to any mortal man upon my honor well then she does remember him but how as kindly i think as he could wish i am glad to hear it for his sake you and i are the friends of both parties we can rejoice with each other he drew his chair much nearer hers and took her hand one moment the widow resisted but it was a magnetic touch the rosy palm lay quietly in his and the dark beard bent so low that it nearly touched her shoulder it did not matter much was he not samuel's dear friend if he was not the rose had he not dwelt very near it for a long long time it was a foolish quarrel that parted them said the stranger softly did he tell you about it yes on board the whaler did he blame her much not so much as himself he said that his jealousy and ill temper drove her to break off the match but he thought sometimes that if he had only gone back and spoken kindly to her she would have married him after all i am sure she would said the widow piteously she has owned it to me more than a thousand times she was not happy then with another mr that is to say her husband was very good and kind said the little woman thinking of the lonely grave out on the hillside rather penitently and they lived very pleasantly together there never was a harsh word between them still might she not have been happier with sam be honest now and say just what you think yes bravo that is what i wanted to come at and now 
I have a secret to tell you, and you must break it to her. Mrs. Townsend looked rather scared. What is it? I want you to go and see her, wherever she may be, and say to her, Maria, what makes you start so? Nothing, only you speak so like someone I used to know once in a while. Do I? Well, take the rest of the message. Tell her that Sam loved her through the hole, that when he heard she was free, he began to work hard at making a fortune. He has got it, and he is coming to share it with her, if she will let him. Will you tell her this? The widow did not answer. She had freed her hand from his and covered her face with it. By and by, she looked up again. He was waiting patiently. Well? I will tell her. He rose from his seat and walked up and down the room. Then he came back and, leaning on the mantelpiece, stroked the yellow hide of bows with his slipper. Make her understand that he wants her for his wife. She may live where she likes and how she likes, only it must be with him. I will tell her. Say he has grown old, but not cold. That he loves her now, perhaps better than he did twenty years ago. That he has been faithful to her all through his life, and that he will be faithful till he dies. The Californian broke off suddenly. The widow answered still, I will tell her. And what do you think she will say? He asked in an altered tone. What can she say but come? Hooray! The stranger caught her out of her chair as if she had been a child and kissed her. Don't! Oh, don't! She cried out. I am Sam's Maria. Well, I am Maria's Sam. Off went the dark wig and the black whiskers. There smiled the dear face she had not forgotten. I leave you to imagine the tableau. Even the cat got up to look, and Beau sat on his stump of a tail and wondered if he was on his heels or his head. The widow gave one little scream, and then she... But stop. Quiet people like you and me, dear reader, who have got over all these follies and can do nothing but turn up our noses at them, have no business here. I will only add that two hearts were very happy, that Bose concluded after a while that all was right, and so lay down to sleep again, and that one week afterward, on Christmas Eve, there was a wedding at the house that made the neighbors stare. The widow had married her first love. End of section 19. Recording by Glennie Junkin, St. Charles, Missouri. Section 20 of A Budget of Christmas Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Old Man's Christmas by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Part One. Though there was wrong on both sides, they never would have separated had it not been for the old man. He was Ben's father, and Ben was an only child, a spoiled, selfish, high-tempered lad, who had grown up with the idea that his father, Anson English, or the old man, as his dutiful son called him, was much richer than he really was, and that he had no need of any personal effort, any object in life, aside from the pursuit of pleasure. Ben's mother had died when he was fifteen years old, and his father had never married again. Yet it was not any allegiance to her memory which had kept Anson English from a second marriage. He remembered her, to be sure, and scarcely a day passed without his mentioning her. But after her death, as during her weary life, he used her name as a synonym for all that was undesirable. He compared everybody to Lisbeth, and always to her disadvantage. He had a word of praise and encouragement and approval for every housewife in the neighborhood except his own. Whatever went wrong, indoors or out, Lisbeth was the direct or indirect cause. During the first five years of her married life, Elizabeth made strenuous exertions to please her husband. 
she wept her sweet eyes dim over her repeated failures then she found that she had been attempting an impossible labor and grew passively indifferent an indifference which lasted until death kindly released her elizabeth had been a tidy housekeeper during these first years you'd scrub and scour a man out of her house and home was all the praise her husband gave her for her order and cleanliness and to his neighbors to whom he was fond of paying informal visits he would often say lisbeth's at it again sweepin and cleanin so i cleared out never see her without a broom in her hand i'd a good deal rather have a little more dirt than so much tearin round lisbeth tires me with her ways yet when in the indifference of despair which seized upon elizabeth before her death she allowed her house to look after itself anson was no better satisfied i've come over to find a place to set down he would tell his neighbors lisbeth let things cumulate till the house is a sight to see she's getting dreadful slack somehow a man likes order when he goes home to rest from all his cares even when she died she displeased him by choosing a busy season for the occasion just like lisbeth to die in hayin time he said everything gotta stop hay spoilin men idle women never seem to have no system about work matters no power of plannin things to make it convenient like for men folks yet after she was gone anson found how much help she had been to him how wonderful her economy had been how light her expenditures he knew he could never find any one to replace her in these respects and as money considerations were the main ones in his mind he believed it would be the better economy to remain a widower and hire his work done so during those most critical years of ben's life he had been without a woman's guidance or care at eighteen he was all that arrogance conceit selfishness and high temper could render him yet he was a favorite with the fair sex for all that as he had a manly figure and a warm caressing way when he chose that won their admiration and pleased their vanity anson english favored early marriages and began to think it would be better all around if ben should bring a wife home she could do the work better than hired help and keep the money all in the family and ben would not waste his time and means on half a dozen as he was now doing but would stay at home no doubt and settle down into a sensible practical business man yes ben ought to marry and his father told him so ben smiled i'm already thinking of it he said he had expected opposition from his father and was surprised at his suggestion yes continued the old man as ben already designated him i'd like to see you settle down before you're twenty-one but you want to make a good choice there's abby wilson now she got the muscle of a man and ain't afraid of anything and her father has a fine property a growin property abby'll make a man a good vigorous helpmate and she'll bring him money in time you'd better shine up to abby ben ben gave a contemptuous laugh i'd as soon marry a dressed-up boy he said she's more like a boy than a girl in her looks and in her ways i have other plans in my mind father more to my taste i mean to marry edith gilman if she'll take me and i think she will a dark frown contracted anson english's brow edith gilman he repeated why that puny schoolma'am with her baby face and weak voice i'll never help you to get a livin ben what are you thinkin of of love father i guess i love her and that's all there is of it and i shall marry her if she'll take me and you can like it or lump it as you please she's a good girl and if she's treated well all around she'll make a good wife and she's the only woman that can put the check rein on me 
when I get in my tempers, she'll make a man of me yet. But she can't work, insisted the father. She looks as white and puny as Lisbeth did the year she died. She is overworked in the schoolroom. I mean to take her home and give her a rest. I don't ask any woman to marry me and be my drudge. I expect my wife will keep help. The old man groaned aloud. Ben's ideas were positively ruinous. If he married this girl, it would add to, not decrease, the family expenses. But it was useless to oppose. Ben would do as he pleased. The old man saw that plainly, and he might as well submit. He did submit, and Ben married Edith on his twenty-first birthday, and brought her home. Part Two Edith was a quiet little creature, with a soft voice, and a pale, sweet face and frail figure. She came up to Anson English when she entered the house, and put her hands timidly upon his arms. "'I want you to love me,' she said. "'I have had no father or mother since I can remember. I want to call you father, and I want to make you happy, if I can.' "'Well, I'll tell you how,' the old man retorted. "'Discharge the hired girl and make good bread. That'll make me happy.' And he laughed harshly. Edith shrank from his rough words, so void of the sympathy and love she longed for. But she discharged the girl within a week, and tried to make good bread. It was not a success, however and the old man was not slow to express his dissatisfaction. Edith left the table in tears. Another dribbler. Lisbeth was always crying just that way over every little thing, sighed the old man. Edith eventually conquered the difficulties of bread-making, and became a famous cook, but she did not please her husband's father any the better by this achievement. "'You're always uh, fixin' up some new sort of trash for the table,' he said to her one day. "'Dessert, is it, you call it? "'Nuff to make a man's patient desert him to see sugar and flour wasted so. "'Lisbeth liked your fancy cookin', but I cured her of it.' "'Yes, and you killed her, too,' cried Edith, for the first time since her marriage, "'losing control of her temper and answering back everybody says you worried her into the grave but you won't succeed so well with me i will live just to defy you if no more and i'll show you that i'll not bear everything too it was all over in a moment and it was not repeated edith was kinder and gentler and more submissive in her manner after that for days as sweet natures always are when they have once broken over the rules which govern their lives. Yet the old man always spoke of Edith as a virago after that. She's worse than Elizabeth, he said, and she had a temper of her own at times that would just singe things. Ben passed most of his evenings and a good part of his days at the village store. He came home the worse for drink occasionally, and he was absolutely indifferent to all the work and care of the farm and family. She's just like Lisbeth, the old man said to his neighbors. She don't make home entertaining for her husband. But Ben isn't balanced like me, and he goes wrong. He's excitable. I never was. The right kind of woman could keep him at home. After a child came to them, matters seemed to mend for a time, so long as the infant lay pink and helpless in its mother's arms, or in its crib, it was a bond to unite them all. So soon as it began to be an active child, with naughty ways which needed correction, it was another element of discord. The old man did not think Edith capable of controlling the child, and Ben was hasty and harsh, and he did not like to hear the baby cry. So he stayed more and more at the store, and was an object of fear to the child, and of reproach to the mother when he did return. They drifted farther apart, and the old man constantly widened the breach between them. 
they had been married six years and the baby girl was four years old when ben struck edith a blow one day and told her to take her child and leave the house in less than an hour she had gone no one knew whither she'll come back more's the pity the old man said lisbeth she started off to leave me once but she concluded to come back and try it over again but edith did not come back months afterward they heard of her in a distant part of the state teaching school and supporting her child ben applied for a divorce on the plea of desertion edith never appeared against him and he obtained it part three one year from the time edith left him he married abby wilson she had grown into a voluptuous though coarse maturity and was dashing in dress and manner her father had recently died leaving her a fine property she had always coveted ben and did not delay the nuptials from any sense of delicacy but rather hastened the hour which should make him legally her own the old man was highly pleased at the turn affairs had taken after all these years ben was united to the woman he had chosen for him so long ago and now surely ben would settle down and take the care off his shoulders shoulders which were beginning to feel the weight of years of labor in truth the old man was breaking down he fell ill of a low fever soon after ben's second marriage and when he rose from his bed he seemed to have grown ten years older he was more childish in his fault-finding and more irritable than ever before and this new wife of ben's had little patience with him she was not at all like edith she bullied him and frightened him into silence when he began to find fault with her extravagances for she was extravagant there was no denying that she cared only for show and outward appearance she neglected her home duties and often left the old man to prepare his own food while she and ben dashed over the country or through the neighboring villages behind the blooded span she had insisted upon his purchasing soon after their marriage poor old anson english he was nearing his sixtieth year now and he looked and seemed much older ben was his only earthly tie and the hope and stay of his old age and he was but a reed a reed his father saw that at last ben would never develop into a practical business man he was unstable lazy and selfish and this new wife seemed to encourage him in every extravagant folly instead of restraining him as the old man had hoped in some way ben had never been the same since edith went away he had been none too good or kind to his father before that but since then well when she went it seemed to anson that she took with her whatever of gentleness or kindness lurked in ben's nature and left only its brutality and selfishness and strive as he would to banish the feeling the old man missed the child ah no he was not happy in this new state of affairs which he had so rejoiced over at the first he grew very old during the next two years like all men who worry the lives of women in the domestic circle he was cowardly at heart and ben's new wife frightened him into silent submission by her masculine assumption of authority and her loud voice and well-defined muscle he spoke little at home now but he still paid frequent visits to his neighbors and he remained firm in the adam-like idea that elizabeth had been the root of all evil in his life yes ben's letting the place run down pretty bad he confessed to a neighbor who had broached the subject ben's early training wasn't right lizabeth she let him do bow as he pleased lizabeth never had no notions of how a boy should be trained he'd a come out all right if i'd a managed him from the start strange to say he never was known to speak one disparaging word of abby ben's second wife her harshness and neglect were matters of common discussion in the neighborhood but the old man who had been so bitter and unjust toward his own wife and edith seemed to feel a curious respect for this amazon 
who had subjugated him or perhaps he remembered how eager he had been for the marriage and his pride kept him silent certain it is that he bore her neglect and later her abuse with no word of complaint and even spoke of her sometimes with praise she's a brave one abby is he would say she ain't afraid of nothin or nobody if she'd been a man she'd have made a noise in the world ben drank more and more and abby dressed and drove in like ratio the farm ran down and debts accumulated debts which abby refused to pay with her money and the old man saw the savings of a long life of labor squandered in folly and vice people said it was turning his brain for he talked constantly of his poverty often walking the streets in animated converse with himself and at length he fell ill again and was wildly delirious for weeks it was a high fever and when it left him he was totally blind and quite helpless he needed constant care and attention he could not be left alone even for an hour ben was seldom at home and abby rebelled at the confinement and restraint it imposed upon her hired help refused to take the burden of the care of the troublesome old man without increased wages and ben could not and abby would not incur this added expense servants gave warning ben drank more deeply and prolonged his absences from home and abby finally carried out a resolve which had at first caused even her hard heart some twinges she made an application to the keeper of the county poor to admit her husband's father to the department of the incurably insane which was adjacent to the poorhouse he's crazy she said just as crazy as can be we can't do anything with him he needs a strong man to look after him ben's never at home and he has everything to look after anyway he can't be broken of his rest and the old man talks and cries half the night i'm not able to take care of him i seem to be breaking down myself with all i have to endure and besides it isn't safe to have him in the house i think he's getting worse all the time he'd be better off and we all would if he was in the care of the county the authorities looked into the matter and found that at least a portion of the lady's statements were true it was quite evident that the old man would be better off in the county house than he was in the home of his only son so he was taken away and abby had her freedom at last we are going to take you where you will have medical treatment and care it is your daughter's request they told him in answer to his trembling queries oh yes yes abby thinks i'll get my sight back i suppose if i'm doctored up well maybe so but i'm pretty old pretty old for the doctors to patch up but abby has a powerful mind to plan things a powerful mind lisbeth never would have thought of sending me away lisbeth was so easy like abby ought to have been a man she had she'd a flung things so he babbled on as they carried him to the poor house it was november and the holidays were close at hand thanksgiving christmas new year abby meant to enjoy them and invited all her relatives to a time of general feasting and merrymaking i feel as if a great nightmare were lifted off my heart and brain now the old man has gone she said he will be so much better off and get so much more skilful treatment you know in a place like that they are very kind in that institution and so clean and nice and he will have plenty of company to keep him from being lonesome we have been all through it during the last year or else we never should have sent him there it is really an excellent home for him part four it was just a year later when a delicate sweet-faced woman was shown through the wards of that excellent home for the poor and unfortunate she walked with nervous haste and her eyes glanced from room to room and from face to face as if seeking yet dreading some object presently the attendant pushed open a partly closed door which led into a small close room 
ventilated only by one high, narrow window. "'This is the room, I believe,' he said, when the lady stepped in and paused. The air was close and impure and almost stifled her. On the opposite side of the room she saw a large crib with a cover or lid which could be closed and locked when necessary, but which was raised now. In this crib, upon a hard mattress and soiled pillow, lay the emaciated form of an old man. He turned his sightless eyes toward the door as he heard the sound of footsteps. "'What is wanted?' he asked feebly. "'Does anybody want me? Has anybody come for me?' "'Oh, father, father!' cried the woman in a voice choked with sobs don't you know me it is i and i have come to take you away to take you away home with me will you go a glow of delight shone over the old man's wasted face like the last rays of the sunlight over a winter landscape he half arose upon his elbow and leaned forward as if trying to see the speaker why it's abby it's abby come at last he said you called me father didn't you and you was crying and it made your voice sound kind of strange and broken like but you must be abby come to take me home oh i thought you'd come at last abby it seems a long long time since i came away you've never been to see me no nor ben either but you've come at last abby you've come at last let me take your hand daughter for i can't see yet they don't seem to help me here as you thought they would and i'm so hungry abby do you think you could manage to get the old man a little something to eat before we start home the woman had grown paler and paler as she listened to these words which the old man poured out in eager haste like one whose thoughts and feelings long pent within himself for want of a listener now rushed forth pell-mell into speech he does not know me she whispered he does not know me well i will not undeceive him now he is happy in this delusion let him keep it for the present then aloud she said you are hungry father do you not have food enough here oh i have my share abby i have my share but my appetite's varying and sometimes when they bring it i can't eat it and then when i want it most i can't get it i'm one of many here and i've been so lonesome abby but then i know you'd come for me all in good time and ben how is ben abby does he want to see his old father again ah uh, ben was a nice little boy a nice little boy but lisbeth wasn't no kind of a mother for such a high-strung lad and then he hadn't oughter married that sickly sort of girl that ran off and left him sakes alive what a temper she had it sort of broke ben down livin with her as long as she did but he remembers his old father at last don't he and he wants to have me home to die ah uh, ben has a good heart after all i must not tell him i must not whispered the woman as she listened bitter to me as his deception is i must let him remain in it then with a sudden bracing of the nerves and a visible effort she said ben is away from home now father he will not be there to meet you but you'll not mind that i shall make you so comfortable i want you at home during the holidays so he went out from the horror and loneliness and gloom of the poorhouse to the comfortable home which edith had provided for herself and child in the years since she left ben ava was a precious little maiden of nine now wise and womanly beyond her years so as soon as edith learned of the old man's desolate fate she resolved to bring him home ava could attend to his wants during the day while she was in the schoolroom and the interrupted studies could be pursued in the evening or she could hire assistance if he were as troublesome as report had said he had been a harsh old man and had helped to widen the breach between her and ben but he was the father of the man she had married 
and she could not let him die in the poorhouse, so she brought him home. "'Don't I hear a child's voice?' he asked, as Ava came dancing out to greet them. "'Who is it, Abby?' "'Why, it's your own little granddaughter, Ava!' cried the child, clasping his withered hand in her two soft palms. "'Don't you remember me? Mama says you used to love me.' Edith's heart stood still. Surely now he would understand. And would he be angry and harsh with her? The old man's face lighted. "'Ah, I see, I see,' he said musingly. "'Abby and Ben have taken the little one home. It must be Edith is dead. She was such a puny thing.' Then turning his face to the woman who was guiding his faltering footsteps, he asked, "'And is Edith dead?' Yes, she answered quietly, Edith is dead, and added, to you, in a whisper. He must never be undeceived, she thought. It would be too severe a blow, the truth might kill him. And to Ava, she said a little later, Dear, your grandfather is very ill, and not quite right in his mind. He thinks my name is Abby, and you must not correct him or dispute any strange thing he may say. The journey left the old man very weak indeed, but he talked almost constantly. It was so good of you, Abby, to take the little girl home, he would say, but I knowed you had a good heart and been to. He was fond of his old father, spite of his rough ways. It was a pooty lonesome, pooty lonesome, off there at that place, that institute where you sent me. Some folk says it was the poor house, but I knew better. I knew better. Ben and you would never send me there. I suppose it was a good place, but they had too many patients. Sometimes I was cold and hungry and all alone for hours and hours. Oh, it was good to be back with you, you, Abby. But why don't Ben come? Ben is away, father. Oh, yes, yes, business, I suppose. Ben'll turn out all right at last. I always thought so. And he sort of outgrows Lisbeth's training. But I hope he'll get back for Christmas. Somehow I've been thinking lately about the Christmas days when Ben was a little boy. We all us put something in his stocking that night. No matter if twain't no more than a sweet cake. Sakes alive, how he prized things he found in his stocking Christmas mornings. I got to thinking about it all last Christmas out of that there institute, and I just laid and bawled like a baby. I was so homesick like. Seemed to me if I could just see Ben's face again, I'd ask nothing more of heaven. And now I think if I can just hear his voice again, it'll be enough. Do you think he'll get home for Christmas, Abby? I hope so, dear father, but I cannot tell. Edith answered softly her heart seeming to break in her breast as she listened. She knew very well that Ben would not go across the street to see the father he had deserted, and that she would never send for him to come to her house to pay even a last visit of mercy. What will I do? How can I explain to him when Christmas comes and Ben does not appear, she thought. But the way was shown her by that great peacemaker who helps us out of all difficulties at last. Christmas Eve, the old man's constant chatter grew flighty and incoherent. He talked of people and things unknown to Edith, and spoke his mother's name many times. Then he fell asleep. In the morning he seemed very weak, and his voice was fainter. Such a strange dream as I have had, Lisbeth, he said as Edith put her hand on his brow and smoothed back the thin white hair. Such a strange dream. I thought Ben had grown into a man and had left me alone, all alone to die. I'm so glad to be awake and find it isn't true. How dark it is and how long the night seems. Tomorrow is Christmas. Did you put something in Ben's stocking, Lisbeth? I have forgotten. Yes, answered Edith, in a choked voice. And it's getting colder, Lisbeth. 
hadn't you better look after Ben a little? See if he's covered up well in his crib. You're so careless, Lizbeth. The boy'll take his death o' cold yet. He's all I've got. He'll make a fine man, a fine man if you don't spoil him, Lizbeth. But you ain't no real sense for training the boy somehow. Is he covered up? It's a bitter, bitter cold. He is well covered, Edith answered. The old man seemed to doze again. Then he roused a little. It's dawn, he said. I see the light breaking. Little Ben'll be crawling out for his stockin' pooty quick. I ought to had the fire made afore this to warm his little toes. Strange you couldn't awake to me, Lizbeth. You don't never seem to have no foresight. Then the old man fell back on Edith's arm. Dead. End of section twenty. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 21 of A Budget Christmas Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Christmas Goblins by Charles Dickens. In an old abbey town, a long, long while ago, there officiated as sexton and gravedigger in the churchyard one Gabriel Grubb. He was an ill-conditioned, cross-grained, surly fellow who consorted with nobody but himself and an old wicker bottle which fitted into his large, deep waistcoat pocket. A little before twilight, one Christmas Eve, Gabriel shouldered his spade, lighted his lantern, and betook himself toward the old churchyard, for he had a grave to finish by next morning, and feeling very low, he thought it might raise his spirits, perhaps, if he went on with his work at once. He strode along until he turned into the dark lane which led to the churchyard, a nice, gloomy, mournful place, into which the townspeople did not care to go except in broad daylight. Consequently, he was not a little indignant to hear a young urchin roaring out some jolly song about a merry Christmas. Gabriel waited until the boy came up, then rapped him over the head with his lantern five or six times to teach him to modulate his voice. And as the boy hurried away, with his hand to his head, Gabriel Grubb chuckled to himself and entered the churchyard, locking the gate behind him. He took off his coat, put down his lantern, and getting into an unfinished grave, worked at it for an hour or so with right good will. But the earth was hardened with the frost, and it was no easy matter to break it up and shovel it out. At any other time, this would have made Gabriel very miserable, but he was so pleased at having stopped the small boy singing that he took little heed of the scanty progress he had made when he had finished his work for the night, and looked down into the grave with grim satisfaction, murmuring as he gathered up his things. Brave lodgings for one, brave lodgings for one, a few feet of cold earth when life is done. Ho, 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 he laughed, as he set himself down on a flat tombstone, which was a favorite resting place of his, and drew forth his wicker bottle. A coffin at Christmas, a Christmas box, ho, 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 repeated a voice close beside him. It was the echoes, said he, raising the bottle to his lips again. It was not, said a deep voice. Gabriel started up and stood rooted to the spot with terror, for his eyes rested on a form that made his blood run cold. Seated on an upright tombstone close to him was a strange, unearthly figure. He was sitting perfectly still, grinning at Gabriel Grubb with such a grin as only a goblin could call up. "'What do you hear on Christmas Eve?' said the goblin sternly. "'I came to dig a grave, sir,' stammered Gabriel. "'What man wanders among graves on such a night as this?' cried the goblin. "'Gabriel Grubb! Gabriel Grubb!' screamed a wild chorus of voices that seemed to fill the churchyard. 
What have you got in that bottle? said the goblin. Holland, sir, replied the sexton, trembling more than ever, for he had bought it off the smugglers, and he thought his questioner might be in, in the excise department of the goblins. Who drinks Holland's alone, and in a churchyard on such a night as this? Gabriel Grubb! Gabriel Grubb! exclaimed the wild voices again. And who, then, is our lawful prize? exclaimed the goblin, raising his voice. The invisible chorus replied, Gabriel Grubb! Gabriel Grubb! Well, Gabriel, what do you say to this? said the goblin, as he grinned a broader grin than before. Sexton gasped for breath. What do you think of this, Gabriel? It's, it's very curious, sir, very curious, sir, and very pretty replied the sexton half dead with fright but i think i'll go back and finish my work sir if you please work said the goblin what work the grave sir oh the grave eh who makes a grave at a time when other men are merry and takes pleasure in it again the voices replied gabriel grub gabriel grub I'm afraid my friends want you, Gabriel, said the goblin. Under favor, sir, replied the horror-stricken sexton. I don't think they can. They don't know me, sir. I don't think the gentlemen have ever seen me. Oh, yes, they have. We know the man who struck the boy in the envious malice of his heart because the boy could be merry and he could not. Here the goblin gave a loud shrill laugh which the echoes returned twentyfold I, I i am afraid i must leave you sir said the sexton making an effort to move leave us said the goblin ha 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 as the goblin laughed he suddenly darted towards gabriel laid his hand upon his collar and sank with him through the earth and when he had time to fetch his breath he found himself in what appeared to be a large cavern surrounded on all sides by goblins ugly and grim and now said the king of the goblins seated in the centre of the room on an elevated seat his friend of the churchyard show the man of misery and gloom a few of the pictures from our great storehouses as the goblins said this a cloud rolled gradually away and disclosed a small and scantily furnished but neat apartment little children were gathered round a bright fire clinging to their mother's gown or gambling around her chair a frugal meal was spread upon the table and an elbow chair was placed near the fire soon the father entered and his children ran to meet him as he sat down to his meal the mother sat by his side and all seemed happiness and comfort what do you think of that said the goblin gabriel murmured something about its being very pretty show him some more said the goblin many a time the cloud went and came and many a lesson it taught to gabriel grubb he saw that men who worked hard and earned their scanty bread were cheerful and happy and he came to the conclusion it was a very respectable sort of world after all no sooner had he formed it than the cloud closed over the last picture seemed to settle on his senses and lull him to repose one by one the goblins faded from his sight and as the last one disappeared he sank to sleep the day had broken when he awoke and found himself lying on the flat gravestone with the wicker bottle empty by his side he got on his feet as well as he could and brushing the frost off his coat turned his face toward the town but he was an altered man he had learned lessons of gentleness and good nature by his strange adventure in the goblin's cavern end of section twenty one